did you know only 17% of small and medium-sized Canadian businesses are owned by women? Well, the federal government says they want to see that percentage rise. Joining us today from Langley to chat about this is Beverly Rasmussen. She is a small business expert who has worked with more than 700 businesses and is the founder of Systems Business Coach. Beverly, it's great to have you with us. Yeah, thanks, Vivian. Great to be here. Now, Beverly, you are an entrepreneur, a published author, and a small business coach. So in your own personal journey as a female entrepreneur, you probably experienced like firsthand the struggles that many other women face when starting a business. So can you just share a bit of your story? Yeah, happy to. Um, I started my first business in 1993. At the time, I was a single mom. And my son was quite busy. He had been kicked out of a number of preschools. And so I had him with me a lot. And uh, one day, he at the, at the agency I was working for, he pulled a plug and he took out every uh, took out the internet for every travel agency in the Fraser Valley. My boss said, don't ever bring your child here again. And so like many entrepreneurs, there's a, there's a story that catapults you into business ownership. So it was clear to me that the only way that I was going to be able to, uh, you know, have a job was to create my own. And so I started this business and fortunately, um, you know, I, I, I built a $3 million a year company. I had seven employees for seven years and I sold that business um, at a time you couldn't give an agency away. So there was a lot of experience and learning in that, which is a lot of what's in my book. Now, why does it seem that it's more difficult for females to obtain financial capital to fund their business? Is there a social mindset that perhaps causes doubt the business ability of women? Um, absolutely. I saw it every step of the way, starting from the very first loan. I couldn't get a traditional loan. I had to get one from a, a third party mortgage at like 14% interest. And then when I took the money into the bank, <laughs> uh, the bank manager said, where'd you get that money? And he made me give it back. And then he gave it to me for 9% interest because all of a sudden now someone else believed that a woman could, you know, get a, get that money. Uh, that was the first experience. Fast forward many years later, I wanted to do a business expansion loan for our company. We were expanding internationally. And uh, some of the I don't want to call them out, but um, one of the loans for women entrepreneurs specifically, they said, yeah, we'll give you a hundred grand, but we're going to control how you spend it. So we're going to give it to you in $5,000 chunks. You would never ask a man. You would never put those kind of constraints on a man. And then the third example recently after the pandemic, there was another loan offered by the government, you know, in, in trying to keep everybody going. And I had to fight, you know, my, my application was as clean as anyone and had to really fight to get that. And I called them out on it. I said, if I was a man, this would not be a conversation we'd be having. So when you're getting these no's as a woman, like how, how are they justifying the no? I think it goes back to what you said, social norms and biases from days gone by. And, um, you know, maybe women don't have as much access to capital. Um, you know, there's still, there's still an imbalance in, in, in the financial landscape across Canada. But they can't just say no because you're a woman. So, like, like how, how are they saying, like, well, we can't offer you this funding because dot, dot, dot. Like, what, what are they saying? They just don't offer it. They just don't offer it. And so you have to fight for it. You have to really. And this is where, you know, speaking to women entrepreneurs, having a really clean business plan, knowing your story like the back of your hand and having a financial model, a business model that you know works and you can see it on paper and you can explain it. That's wow. really, we, we need to be a little, little, even more diligent about what we're presenting here to the bank. So what can women do to have more success in accessing accessing funding for their business ventures? Yeah, well, it starts with that. It starts with a solid business plan. You'd be surprised of the 700 business owners I've worked with, and quite a few of them women. They admit maybe two or three or four conversations in that they actually don't understand their income statement or their balance sheet. They don't really understand how the money flows through their organization. That's across all genders, by the way. I'm not just speaking to women. Every business owner has that issue, the ones that are struggling. And so that's the number one thing, know your numbers. That that will get you, you know, when you can say, you know, I'm going to make salt as an example. This is, this is my sales. This is my cost of goods sold. This is how I know it's going to be. This is my operating costs. It's a no-brainer. And then with women, there's always the challenge with juggling the, the work and life balance with family. Any suggestions on that area? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, the thing that worked really well for me, having been a single mom at the time, is I had to get that business to run independent of me. I, one, I had to, it had to be profitable because I would risk my house. I put my house on the line to remortgage to buy it, and I had to get it to run independent of me. And that's the difference between creating a job and creating a business. So you're creating a business, and so you want to take yourself out of it. Yes, if you're a 
you know, a, a hairstylist and you want to cre create a salon, you know, you need to be able to have that salon running independent of you doing hair. And so that's the trick. Put those systems and structure in place so that, um, you know, it takes a little bit of work, but, you know, run, build it like a real business. Do you have any advice on how to get a business started that runs so passively? Yeah, it's step by step. It's again, having that business model and then thinking about, you know, the things that you do really well as a founder, we want to make sure that we document them and we do them on time, every time, exactly as promised. Everyone in my organization did things, what we call the Somerville way. It was Somerville travel. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't Beverly's way, it was the Somerville way. And so the things that we did well, we did over and over again. And those were the standards that we set. Just like Starbucks, FedEx, McDonald's, those same ideas. If you start that from the beginning, then you won't lose the essence of what you're bringing to the table. So maybe you're bringing a better widget, but you need to make sure that everyone does it your way at the beginning. And that doesn't mean there's not room for improvement. It's obviously continuous improvement, but having that base uh, is a really good, a really good start. And what are some things, some things that women can or should do differently in their business than men do that makes them stand out? Well, what I, I, I like that question. The one thing that they already are doing is they actually hire more women. Like it's, the statistics are two and a half times more uh, women business owners have women uh, leaders in their organizations. And so, you know, building off the, um, you know, off that capital, that's, that's been really helpful. It's interesting that you said that because uh, I was recently uh, chatting with uh, a sociology professor and she was saying that when we were talking about uh, gender pay gaps and women in the workforce and in business, they're saying that employers tend to hire people that either like remind them of themselves or remind them of the previous employees. So men tend to gravitate towards uh, men and women would tend to gravitate uh, towards more women. Now, a big part of what you do is coach women, especially in the area for developing systems for their specific business. Can you explain what you mean by systems? Yes, I love that question. Because when I started this, people think of systems as your you know, standard operating procedure or a, you know, a manual that sits on the wall. But it, my definition of a system is a system is simply the way something happens. So systems thinking allows us to say like, if you don't deal with an employee that shows up late every day and you just allow them to just continue to disrupt the organization, that in itself is a system. It's a broken system. So what is the system you need to have in place to, to deal with late employees? How to open the store, how to close the store, how to do your social media, every single thing, your leadership style. I built 52 different competencies related to leadership, operations, finance, marketing, uh, team building, all, all different systems that you need, a delegation system, a communication system. It sounds a bit overwhelming, but when you put it through the lens of a system, it starts to bring it from some wild concept into really narrow focus. So you can say, okay, these are the things that I need. And what I say to entrepreneurs, any, anything in your business that's hurting your reputation or is costing you money or something that you don't know how to do, those are the systems to focus on first. Get those documented, figure them out and say, like, how do we want to do that? And it seems like systems are, are a really great tool for making things efficient. Uh, I'm reminded of that uh, movie that they did on, uh, on Ray Kroc and where he was uh, founding the McDonald's Corporation and they had a system for everything. Like the fries were always on one side of the, of, of the kitchen and uh, they did the, uh, and the, the kitchen was right in the center and you know, the, everything was laid out exactly the, the same. And I just remember like one of my coaches telling me like system should actually be an acronym, save yourself time, energy, and money. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Now, is there a system to figure out if there is a market for your product in your area or if it's already over, overly saturated? Yeah, again, um, going back to the planning, business planning, and um, you know, I, I'll give you a couple of, uh, once you, let's say you're, you're going in and we're talking to business owners that are already in place. So pay attention to what's going on. So I'll ask someone when working with them, I say, how did you get your first client? And they'll, and they'll tell you right away what they did. You know, they went, they put flyers, like you know, a roofer, for example, went and put, you know, flyers on all the neighbors' roofs, houses to say, hey, we're doing your neighbor's roof. And that got them lots of business. And over time, they stopped doing that. You know, with the travel agency, I learned, I figured out that people would buy, seniors would buy uh, fall color tours in February. And that was a big ticket item. It was $5,000 per couple. They would book every year, September 7, 8, 9, somewhere in there. So I started blocking half the bus and then marketing in February. And I would fill half the bus every time. Whereas the concrete show in Vegas were typically men going at the last minute. So I would block hotel rooms at a premium and I would sell them three, four, five days before the Vegas show. 
So in each individual business, there's things that are happening. So not to get distracted by the newspaper lady that comes in and said, you know, we're doing a remembrance day. Do you want to, or like have your, have your marketing systems well established so that, you know, okay, my clients on TikTok, that's where I need to, for an example, for young, you know, for a particular market. So you need to know where you know, where your clients are, what they're doing, where they're hanging out and be the authority in that space. And when it comes to pricing, you don't want to be too high, but you certainly don't want to undersell uh, your products or your services or what your what you or what your products are actually actually worth. So, how can a business owner like really hit that sweet spot on how to price the product or service? Mm -hmm. And it's a constant it's a constant um, challenge because right now, think about this: last year, interest rates have gone up, um, inflation. Uh, minimum wage has gone up, gas is, everything has gone up and business owners are so kind and they want to be nice to their customers. And especially women business owners are like, yeah, but I can't raise my prices to my clients because they're not going to be able to afford or they're not going to like me. There's a more of that going on. And so being ruthless with your numbers, you need to, if, if you don't have a financial business model that works, you don't have a business. So really, you need to know, like, you know, if minimum wage goes up by a dollar, by one dollar, that's twenty five hundred dollars in Canada per year that you're going to have to spend per employee. So where are you going to get that money from? So go back to whether it's a, you know, restaurants are notorious for failing again because of these keeping that pricing model and knowing what it is every week, a system for monitoring your financials. That would be a, a perfect system. So then you can adjust your prices as you need to. And for anyone, starting a business is a very risky thing. But any advice to women who are struggling to overcome the fear of failure? Hmm. Yeah, I guess I think it goes back to, if, if I look at my own situation, um, it was terrifying. And I didn't sleep for two weeks before it opened. Oh, and wow. I just remember, remember that fear. And so going back, had you know, I had a business plan that my landlord made for me. And looking back, if I had had really spent more time with that plan and understood what I was getting into, it would have mitigated a lot of that risk. Um, so again, it goes back to planning, get a mentor, meet with people from your industry. You know, you don't have to meet with someone in your town in your industry, but find someone in the US or in Europe or across Canada and partner up with another women entrepreneur uh, as one example. Um, find out what, find out, you know, wh where are the traps? And just if you know that 50% are going to fail, make the decision to be on the good side of that from the beginning. Don't do this with your, I got my hands in front of my face for those listening. Yeah. <laughs> and can you share any success stories of women who have managed to get a business started up and are still continuing successfully? Yeah, there's lots. Uh, one of my, a uh, couple of, right off the top of my head, uh, Angie Quayley. She owns uh, Well Seasoned, a gourmet food store here in Langley. I think their business just celebrated 20 years. Um, she's been a powerhouse in our community, you know, contributing to so many causes and um, systematized her business and just uh, always has time for you. She's done really well. Uh, Sasha Pryor of Neza Naturals on Vancouver Island. They have a natural uh, uh, product store doing extremely well on Johnson Street and running that business. And and I I could I could give you another 60, 70, 80, you know, give me some more time and I'll, I'll plug all of them. They're doing really well. Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time, but what would you say to the women who are watching right now who are thinking of taking that step into starting up a business? Yeah, do your homework. Uh, that's one. We've talked about the business plan over and over. The other thing, which was advice that I got, which I really appreciate is, is have more money available than you think you're going to need. So let's say you think you're going to need a hundred grand to get this thing off the ground, you know, add 25% more. Even if you never use it, it was advice given to me. I had I borrowed an extra twenty five thousand dollars. That story's in the book, and I put it aside and I gave it back to the person who I borrowed it from. I didn't need it, but just knowing that it was there because you will, no one will lend you money at the point when you have no money. They'll only lend you money when you have you know at the when you have that ability. So take it a little bit more. Don't spend it, but just have it there and hire a business coach. Get some mentoring. Get some help. Don't do it. All. You don't need to do this alone. If you're feeling alone and you're struggling, reach out. Talk to your business bank manager. Um, just reach out. Beverly Rasmussen is the founder of Systems Business Coach. Beverly, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. I'm Naveen Day. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.